met this woman and she'd run for Senate and she said, she said, you should run. I have life experience too. I understand what normal people are dealing with. I think it's very important to think very hard and long about the decisions and the things that we do, what we put in front of our children in the classroom. 25, 30 years ago, we'd be having the same conversation about the television. And what we're really preparing for is major earth changes. Blues is emotion music. And and the blues is, is political music on top of everything else. First day that I was out there protesting in December, you know, I, I met this woman and she'd run for Senate and she said, she said, you should run. I have life experience too. I understand what normal people are dealing with. Well, you know, I've worked in federal government or with federal programs for a decade now. So I understand exactly how the federal government works. I know how to improve programs. I know how to streamline things and to save money on the part of the federal government. And frankly, I'm sick of it not working for the people. I think most of you have probably met me or seen me around or heard. When women and men have exactly the same resume and they have the objective credentials that we would expect of most candidates, Men look in the mirror and say, yeah, I'm qualified to run for office. And women are about 20 percentage points more likely to express self-doubt. When I was a teenager, I sued an employer over sexual assault. I will be resigning as a member of the United States Senate. I am retiring today. I was terrified. I thought that he was going to rape me. These allegations are completely false. What do these guys have to offer? What have they been doing? What? What are their qualifications, really? It's sad that it's as prevalent as it is, and we certainly need to do something about it. And I think it's gonna be women leading that charge in Congress to fix it. It's, it's just a fact of life. It's something that they have to deal with until we can fix it, until society at large takes it seriously. And I don't mean just women, we need men stepping up and saying, this is absolutely unacceptable. I think that if ever there was a time, it's right now, right now. And women pull better in this district too. About 10 years, six months ago, I was on a refugee camp in Ghana. Uh, I moved to the United States in uh, 2007. Where I came from, uh, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, it's a diverse area, but you know, I'm used to seeing some things that others may not have. You know, some people are flipping out over Confederate flags. I grew up, I've seen that, you know, my whole life. Um, coming from a very small town, which is Rich Grove, California, 99.9% .9 Hispanics, it was a culture shock. Uh, my first language was Spanish. My father is Danish. He's first generation here. My mother's Portuguese and Native American, so I haven't been treated any different on that. Now, as far as being female, I'm one of three in my entire unit that does my jobs. I live most of my life on a refugee camp. Uh, I'm from Liberia, West Coast of Africa. 
Uh, we had a lot of, we had a civil war in that country. My first obstacle that I did have to overcome as a female, but I took it in with pride, just not for myself, but for my unit. It's not about a gender or race or, or any, 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 anything of that nature. It's more about the pride that we do here in the 82nd. It's I was always aware of the, the diversity, just being military in general. I knew that you know people come from every every walk of life, and, and I was willing for it. And and with that, with the willingness, I've like I said, I've met some very amazing people, and, and it has opened my eyes to a lot, and I've gained a lot of wisdom through those people. One of the threads throughout our 100 year history is the idea that we've always represented the broad cultural experience. We've always represented the American experience. In 1917, we had to mobilize for a global war for the first time. And this is the first division that was organized with people from all over the country, all 47 states. And this was very unique at the time. This had never happened. And so uh, we were named the All-Americans. And, you know, that's really been consistent throughout our history. We were the first, many people don't know this, but we were the first American unit of any size that was racially uh, diverse, that was inclusive of all races. Diversity in the United States is, uh, Army is, is huge. And because of so many different culture blending to become one, it has become a unique factor for me because I'm able to interact with people that are from different countries, different parts of the world, and we're able to get along. So we're able to understand each other. In the outside world, I'm kind of concerned, I mean, I think there are folks that, that are sensitive, there, there's folks, there's racism still exists. I mean, there are serious problems out there. I don't see that in the military because we just don't tolerate it, but you know, you, all you have to do is turn on the TV, turn on social media, you hear about these hate crimes all the time. We don't look at how the planets themselves form. We look at how the universe creates the elements that the planets need to form in the first place. Subterranean astronauts. Uh, we're, we're trying to understand stuff that happens deep, deep in space by coming a mile underground. But this is the only place that we can get away from all the radiation and all the cosmic rays that exist on the surface world so that we can actually study this stuff in radio silence. Uh, CASPAR itself was a project to help us understand uh, how did the universe do all this? How did it put together all the pieces that make the complexity of our current universe possible? We don't look at how the planets themselves form. We look at how the universe creates the elements that the planets need to form in the first place. So if, if there were people studying the bricks that build up a house, we're the guys that study the atoms that make up the bricks. Wow. Yeah, we go really, really fundamental. There we go. And then you use those to tie around the back. Yep. So this is the Myrana Demonstrator Experiment, which is a neutrinoless double beta decay experiment. We want to understand why we're here, and here, us being matter. Why is there more matter in the universe than antimatter? Uh, we don't really understand why there's this imbalance. And so what we're looking at is neutrinos. We think that neutrinos might have the answer to why the universe is here. And so this is a fundamental science experiment, understanding why matter exists. I'm here in a clean room suit, so that's keeping me out of the room, keeping me from bringing in any, any debris that could be radioactive, just dust. We've been taking data from the detector from the time we plugged it in, and then as it grew into the experiment that you see here. And then as it is now, it plans to take data uh, until May, where we're gonna open it up and, and do some minor adjustments, and then it should run through 2021. Anytime you have fundamental science, there's a whole birth of other industries that come out of this information from understanding how the detectors work, understanding how you put these systems together. It spawns new industries just from the development of these for the first time.
So this is an 18 square mile property. There's 575 uh, former military bunkers on the south side of the property. And then on the north side, there's another 275. And those, that will be our phase two. This is phase one. And what we're really preparing for is major earth changes. Okay. We're looking at just the road that goes from bunker to bunker to bunker, a hundred miles of road wow. within the property. Okay. So what we're doing is we're starting at this corner and we're working our way across one row at a time and we're leasing them out and people are buying them for $25,000 up front and $1,000 a year for 99 years. That's uh -huh. nothing. The bunker is, you can fit enough food in here in any one of the bunkers, plus hygienic products, plus fuel, everything that you need without reopening the door for a minimum of one year. But you know, these kind of events we're preparing for, they're gonna survive the event, they're gonna survive the immediate aftermath in their bunker, but at some point they'll be able to open the blast door and go out. But stay here, this becomes a new home base, a new town, and they can farm and grow food and have animals and so on and start over right here. Yeah, this is the one that we're building the showroom unit. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah! About 2,200 square feet inside. And what will be here? Well, we have a series of rooms. Let me show you. This room here is a theater. So let's go inside. Theater? Theater. So there'll be theater seating here, really comfortable, you know, reclining, uh -huh. leather, and a very large screen TV there, sound system. And there'll also be an exercise equipment in here so you could work wow. out. So we've thought of everything. It's going to be a very nice, it's fantastic. very cozy place. You know what the name of this place is? Yes, Vivos X Point. Vivos X Point. X Point is the point in time when only the prepared will survive. This is a technology that's really, really cool. It actually allows you to scan the contents of your refrigerator. And I just click the camera button. You can see that it's identified an artichoke, pineapple, bell pepper, broccoli, orange. Smart home's been out there for quite a while now, um, but customers don't really understand exactly what it is. A smart home isn't one light bulb that you can control from your phone, it's not one thermostat that you can control from your phone. A smart home is uh, the whole range of products working together harmoniously. So we've got a range of products that work on certain different protocols, different connectivity. There's the heart of the home, which is the hub. All of our products can connect to the, the hub. You can then use your smartphone through our Hive app, wherever you are in the world, as long as you've got an internet connection, to control these devices, to schedule these devices. And then we've recently launched our feature called Hive Actions, which is something that integrates all of the products together. You can even check our email here. And we're going to write a note. If you don't want to use it, you can just slide down. Alexa, play Adele. Shuffling songs by Adele. We're here showcasing the One Link Safe in Town. It's a smoke and carbon monoxide alarm that also has a speaker built in that leverages your home ceiling as an acoustic backdrop for an optimal sound experience. It also has Apple HomeKit and it will have AirPlay 2 as soon as that becomes available. And it has Alexa inside it, so you just talk to it and you can ask it what the weather is or to play a song or what your schedule is like, all in one device. We have the world's smartest window coverings. Uh, right now we sell um, retrofit kits um, that fit inside of all uh, major brands of roller shades and horizontal blinds. These work directly via Bluetooth, um, so you don't need a special hub or anything. You just connect your phone. You can store specific schedules and set custom temperature settings and light settings so they open and close automatically and also open and close on schedules that you set with your preference and our custom app. And this is a technology that's really, really cool. It actually allows you to scan the contents of your refrigerator using a camera embedded within the Yemli app. So I'm in the search mode right here and then I just click the camera button. 
So I'm actually in the camera itself. And then all I'm going to do is just going to do a quick scan of the ingredients that I have here on the table. You can see that it's identified an artichoke, pineapple, bell pepper, broccoli, orange, uh, maybe even some butternut squash. And then based on those, those ingredients that I have on hand, I can actually swipe up and Yemli will recommend for me those, those recipes that involve the ingredients I have on hand. So this is just an example of our, our monitoring system. We're looking at a particular intersection uh, in our uh, north and uh, north and ramp at, uh, in our Atlanta deployment. Uh, so you're looking at, the, at an intersection from the four different approaches here. Um, and uh, this, uh, just watching the approaching traffic and the traffic as it leaves. It's a real-time online planning approach. So we watch the approach, each intersection watches the approaching traffic through its detection. Uh, in some cases it's video cameras, uh, other cases we're using radar. Um, we could even use the, the old induction loops that you, you think remember from under the ground. Um, and uh, from that information that we take in, the system builds a prediction of when every vehicle it sees uh, through its detection is actually going to arrive at the intersection. And then based on that prediction, we, we uh, build a, what's called a timing plan, a plan for how the green's going to get distributed uh, to each, each approach um, in real time uh, and begin executing that plan. The traffic signal control, uh, particularly in urban environments, hasn't really changed in 50 years. Um, you know, it's, it's based on this notion of, of uh, going out uh, counting cars for a, a, a day or two, uh, you know, getting a snapshot of what traffic patterns are like, and then on the basis of that snapshot, uh, you build some signal timing plans for an intersection or a set of intersections, uh, and then they run that plan over and over again, unfailingly forever. In the longer term, I think we see that uh, really the opportunities uh, for the, that as the, as, as the world becomes more connected, that the intersection is really, in some sense, going to be a gateway of real-time information. And you know, we're collecting all this real-time information uh, of tra with, you know, traffic flows, and uh, we're currently working on technology that will allow us to, to do real-time uh, performance analysis of the network. And once we can do that, then maybe we can parlay that into being able to do real-time incident detection uh, uh, you know, uh, traffic accidents, maybe uh, even more stable things like a road segment being closed for a week or two, uh, uh, replacing the sewer pipes or, or something like that. So you know this is an addictive device, but so is a chocolate bar. And so is um, anything that you do in excess. And um, so is YouTube bad or good? No, but YouTube in moderation is definitely good. I don't think there's anything worrisome. I think it's expensive and sometimes trivial. I think it's very important to think very hard and long about the decisions and the things that we do, what we put in front of our children in the classroom. It's the same questions applied in different formats, right? So, you know, 25, 30 years ago, we'd be having the same conversation about the television, right? So do you let your daughter watch TV? How much do you let her watch TV? Uh, 10 years ago, we'd have the same conversation about the internet. You know, do you, well, do you have your daughter have access to the internet? So I think, as I was mentioning before, so what we're really proud of at VEX is, you know, we're an education company. Yes, as, as tech companies, we should be giving teachers more research, more information, and then once we have a better understanding of the tools to meet the needs identified by that research information. I'm old fashioned. Okay, I don't think they need to be talking to someone via a sort of three-dimensional projection of reality through some really advanced technology. I cannot believe that's what they need. Okay, I do believe they need social interaction. They need to work with their peers. Uh, they need to be learning things in a fun way. However, learning cannot always be fun, right? And, uh, and most of all, I think they need to open up to the real world. So from that perspective, the important thing is not so much what the technology is, 
but it's the interactions that the technology allows the students to do. So does the technology enable students to have great interaction with their peers? Does the technology enable students to have great interactions with their teachers? Does it allow students to collaborate well, both with their peers and with their teachers? So if the technology is accomplishing those goals while also accomplishing its learning objectives, in addition to that, then you really have something that the teachers and the schools can use effectively in their classrooms. I'm a social activist. I take my music and what I do is I incorporate the stories of my life as a black person in America. My name is Ursula Ricks. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I'm a soul funk blues singer. Been around for about 35 years. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and I was raised in Texas. I have a mother, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunts were all activists when I was young. So I've always been under the impression that when there's something wrong in our government, you protest. You, let people know that it is not something you're willing to vote for. I have a, a very eclectic cultural group of people that come and check out the music that I do. I'm a social activist. I take my music and what I do is I incorporate the stories of my life as a black person in America and set up a song to why I like this song, what it is about this song that moves me and what I think will move them. And the blues is, is political music on top of everything else. It's the music that helps uh, groups of people strive forward to make a better community. We all procreate, we all grow, and things change, and generation to generation, we owe it to the next generation to give them the world that they want. And the world that they want is multicultural.